Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Tulsa World Opinion Podcast. I'm Jenny Graham, the editorial's editor, and I am here today with Anna Johnson, and she is a Georgetown professor and researcher with specialties in child development and public policy. And importantly, she has been working in Tulsa since 2016, researching around early childhood, looking at program effectiveness, particularly among low-income children, and she's written an op-ed this weekend. So hello, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Well, real quick, because I don't think everyone here, people listening, really understand or even are aware that Georgetown researchers have been in Tulsa for at least 20 years. I think 20 years last year was the anniversary right. of researching early childhood programs. And I, I think people sort of take that for granted, but this research is groundbreaking. It's brought international attention. It is, it has, it should be leading public policy decisions, but it is some of the most important work around early childhood because it has followed children for 20 years to see outcomes. Right. So, but right now you're working on something called the SEED study, S-E-E-D, with the University of Oklahoma, Tulsa. Can you just explain for a moment what it is you're researching right now, what that study is? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just go back a little bit because I always have to acknowledge that I stand on the shoulders of absolute giants. So you talked about the Tulsa research starting more than 20 years ago, and that was research that started with my beloved colleagues, um, Professor Bill Gormley and Professor Deborah Phillips, both of whom have just retired. Um, so they've kind of passed the torch to me in some ways. Um, but their research is research that started in the early 2000s um, in Tulsa, looking at kids who attended pre-K in Tulsa around 2005, 2006. Those kids are now, you know, in college and, um, and they've continued to follow those children and document really strong, long lasting positive effects of pre-K on things like, you know, high school graduation rates and college enrollment um, and, and things that we think are really important as um, kids become adults. So that is kind of what we think of as like the uh, first generation of Tulsa Georgetown partnership and Tulsa pre-K research. And that's what really put Tulsa on the map. And you are right. It is nationally recognized. Um, it is a reference point for, you know, 30 other states and cities that are rolling out universal public pre-kindergarten programs. So California, um, you know, Tennessee has referenced the uh, Tulsa research, Alabama, New Mexico, New Jersey. I mean, there these are places all over the country um, that are that are looking to Tulsa and its earlier research as like a shining example of what could be. Um, my research that started um, kind of building on top of that earlier work started with kids who went to preschool in 2017. Um, so there, you know, there it's a different cohort of preschool attenders in Tulsa. Um, and that's the Tulsa SEED study that you mentioned. So SEED stands for School Experiences in Early Development. Um, and that's uh, kids who um, are now in fifth grade. And so we've been following them every year, measuring their um, kind of academic learning, their social uh, learning, their um, health, their well-being, and their self-regulation, um, measuring their classroom contexts and their teacher processes and their peer relationships and um, doing all that work in partnership with, like you said, the University of Oklahoma, Tulsa. Um, and so that uh, that research has really been designed to answer, you know, does Tulsa pre-K still um, work as well as it did in that earlier research? And these kids are only in fifth grade, but so far it looks like it does. And what's so interesting that. about this research is that it does also, because it follows them from pre-K on through, is that you can kind of start learning things that are happening in elementary schools. And I know with the first generation, you can actually pinpoint uh, when, and I remember at one point, we, getting, we don't wanna get too much off the subject, but there was this concern about fade out. But then because you followed them, you found out, oh no, somewhere in high school, some of that foundational learning came back into play. And so it showed that those kids did gain benefits. But what was interesting, and I wanna get back to your op-ed for this weekend. And honestly, I wanna send this to every lawmaker and everyone in the state, because I think it is so important for what you're finding. And to just sum up the piece, and it'll be online tomorrow and in print in the Tulsa World on Sunday, 
you wrote about some of the the problems maybe of the third grade standardized test being how it's being used or the over-reliance in decision-making for the students, yeah. particularly because that third grade test, and I've always was, and I've been personally uncomfortable with how much emphasis was on this one day test, but because it determines whether they are retained, what classes they're put in for the fourth and fifth grade. And, and, and specifically what you state in the op-ed was that these tests are not capturing all that these kids know. Right. So can you sort of provide an example of what you found in the Oklahoma third grade test that is it, they're not capturing what we think it's capturing? Yeah. Yeah. So part of what um, one of the strengths of the Tulsa Seed study, this new generation, is that we've done a much deeper dive into right. not only those classroom processes and teacher things um, that might explain those long term outcomes, but also the outcomes themselves. And so what we've done in this newer generation of research um, is, you know, look beyond kind of what we what we typically look at in in uh, you know big education evaluations, um, which is like standardized test scores of like literacy skills uh, and math, um, and that's what state standardized tests capture as well. Um, and so what we've done in this Tulsa Seed study is is kind of look under the hood a little more and and assess kids twice a year every year since 2017 on uh, a range of skills that are some of which are probably tapped in those state tests and those kind of more typical tests of literacy and math, and, and some of which, you know, we suspected um, were not. So those other skills are things like uh, expressive vocabulary, like oral vocabulary, or an understanding of like complex sentence structure and grammar. Like it's different to say the big dog sat under a tree than it is to say you know, the dog sat under a big tree, like moving that word around changes the meaning, right? That's syntax, that's grammar. Um, uh, you know, the the number of, of words children know and can recognize. Um, and then math is not just solving a word problem, which is what most standardized math tests do, but also how quickly can you differentiate number symbols from each other? Like knowing that a three is smaller than a seven really quickly is actually related to your numeracy and your math abilities. Um, so we administered all these different kinds of math tests and all these different kinds of vocabulary and syntax and sentence structure tests in addition to the more typical literacy and math uh, tests. And, um, and what that allowed us to do was by the time our kids hit third grade um, and took the state standardized test, we could compare in third grade how they did on these other measures that our study administered to how they did on the state standardized tests. And what we found, which I think was a little bit surprising even to us, is that the correlation, which is just a measure of how much you know overlap or similarity there are between those two tests, the correlations were um, pretty modest. So not you know 100% or even like 80% lower than that, more like 50%, maybe lower, more like 40%. So overlap between what the state test of math is telling us about kids and overlap between what kids can actually do mathematically, like quickly processing differences between numbers was very low. And what that suggests is that the state math test, which is heavily based on math word problems, and that requires kids to have good language skills, good reading comprehension, and pretty good what we call like executive functioning, being able to remember and keep in mind, you know, if Tommy is rowing his boat 80 miles that way and John is rowing his boat 30 miles this way, who's going to arrive at the destination first? You have to remember what Johnny is 30 that and that's a lot of other skills besides math. That's not just math. So this standardized math test score is is confounding or involving language reading skills and these memory executive function skills in a math test. Whereas our math test, which is kind of a pure foundational math test, um, didn't overlap very highly with those skills, suggesting that that math test is not capturing everything that kids can do in math. So, um, and I find that interesting because, I mean, in, in Oklahoma has certainly emphasized literacy, and I think that's where it came from. But it, it I can see where and, and maybe parents don't understand, and I think because we don't know what the tests show, that when we are sent home math homework, it's multiplication tables, it is adding, subtracting, but when they're taking a test, 
it's a it's a reading problem. And so I could see where kids who are really talented at computation that but might not be as strong in in reading yet because we are talking third grade where the tests don't um, are reflective of what they can actually do. And that really concerned me when I was reading your op-ed. So what are, are and, and is, and is it, is that a similar, is there a similar problem in the, the reading side of things? Or is this really what you're seeing as a pretty big gap with, with the math scores, the math results? No, we see a similar, um, similar story with reading for sure. So our tests of oral language, for instance, like expressive vocabulary, you know, identifying, um, you know, producing, vocabulary words, right. new words, different words. How many words do you have for the same object? Um, how complex is your language? Um, and, and these kind of more sentence structure things. Um, those things don't seem to be particularly well captured by the state ELA test, which is really a test of reading comprehension. Also important, reading comprehension is, is important, um, but it's not the whole story about what kids know and can do with respect to language and literacy skills. So uh, the reading test, state standardized test is also missing some important um, language and literacy skills. It, what's concerning to me is that from after reading your op-ed, I'm thinking of, and I think you mentioned this in there, is that it leads to maybe a kid who is really talented in math and computation, but the scores show low because maybe their reading isn't as high, but then they're put into a remedial math class or they're put into to a low to a, a class that's not challenging them enough. And that puts right. them on a progression that they're not that they're not getting what they need. And on the other side, you might find a kid who tested well on something, but maybe in actuality needs more mentoring or help in some areas. Right. Does that happen often where a kid the results show something that they're better at when maybe in actuality they're not as they're not scoring as high or their skills are not as right. Reflective. So I think the piece that we um, are missing is like how school you know within the school the decision making process happens right. So schools I think have a have a little bit of leeway at the mm -hmm. kid level um, you know to to decide you know look I, I've been this kid's teacher and I know full well this kid is quite good at math this score isn't showing me that, does that mean I need to put the kid in a, in a math skills group um, or not? I think schools make some of those decisions. So we don't have really clear insight into exactly what you're saying. If the mismatch uh, definitively leads to substantial number of kids getting misclassified, but we strongly suspect that it does. Um, and I think it's important to recognize, and I, I was on the phone with a superintendent of a, a different school district earlier. Um, it's important to recognize that these are consequential um, these tests matter for schools, for school report cards, for school funding formulas, for school performance and uh, teacher performance. So um, it's, you know, I think if if teachers uh, are teaching kids skills that allow them to do well on some tests that are, you know, and not others, um, or teachers are teaching kids skills and kids are doing quite well in some areas, but not areas that are represented on these state tests, then a, a teacher or a school might also, um, you know, be unfairly kind of penalized. So I don't think we have the data yet to know uh, exactly, you know, how close to that cutoff you are and whether you're being put in group A when you really belong in group B on the kid level. I think we have strong suspicions that that's happening because we know how these tests are used. And I think we have similarly strong suspicions about how it might affect, you know, teacher and, and school, uh, you know, kind of reward versus punishment. I, and, and so I understand what you're saying now. It's it's more that the schools, it might show they're not doing well in math when in actuality, maybe they are, maybe the teachers are teaching these great functions, but because these are reading problems and not straight math problems. It's giving an unfair view of what's happening at school. And that's, that's incredibly important because in, in, as you know, in the state of Oklahoma, we're talking about school report cards. And unfortunately, so much is based on penalizing schools rather than incentivizing yeah. schools. Yeah. Or yeah. Them. yeah. But, but you know, the, with, with this, the state test, I'm wondering, because you've worked with other states, is this an issue with the Oklahoma standardized test in particular, or are we talking about standardized tests overall? Are there problems with these? I mean, in general, I guess my question is, is there a perfect standardized test? 
Is there something out there that's like, oh, yeah. No. And I think, I mean, I think that's a really good question. And I think, you know, we say this in the op-ed, like we're not recommending we do away with standardized right. tests. Standardized tests, there's not going to be a perfect solution. And, you know, it, it, standardized tests serve an important purpose. Um, right. But I will say that I think we need to scale back on how much uh, weight we place on them. And I think we need to recognize that they have um, imperfections and that they're not telling the whole story um, about kids' capabilities. And, and you know, my kids are in D.C., Washington, D.C. public schools, totally different, you know, school district, part of the country, et cetera. Um, and, and they, too, starting in third grade, you know, take these standardized tests every spring. Um, and I think, you know, I think my questions, you know, are, are let's let's think about how we're using third grade in particular. So that's when it starts across the country. That's why this is such an important time point to call attention to in our data, because it does apply across the country. Um, you know, third grade, kids are still, like you said, kind of getting their sea legs under them. Reading is still developing unevenly. Um, there's a lot more variation even within a skilled domain. So within the broad area of English language arts, ELA, you know, you could have a kid who's doing great at vocabulary and still struggling with reading comprehension. So they're still young enough where you might have that unevenness. And there it might be really important to capture that before you start holding kids back, which affects, you know, their self-esteem and their learning trajectory. And of course, the school's measure of accountability and success. Is there some reason that third grade has become this magic uh, benchmark. I, I, I mean, I know it's important, but having seen firsthand through my kids and I mean, these schools shut down. I mean, I think you mentioned that they take a break from learning because in my kids elementary school, I mean, they shut it down. We had water and mints because mints is supposed, mint was supposed to help with brain development. And it was all this easy stuff too. because there was just so much pressure, but I kept thinking, why third grade? <laughs> There's something magical about this age that we've just put all this pressure on. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it is, um, it is an important, uh, baseline. It's kind of the earliest you could reasonably do a, a, a standardized test. You know, you have most kids, um, you know, on average achieving a, a base level of reading and math. And so you could actually give a, a self-administered test, you know, before that kids are really too young to reliably sit and follow directions and, you know, do do a self-administered or a cappy, you know, they wear the headphones and it gives them the instructions. So they're they're too young before that. Um, and I think, you know, when this all came about was really with the No Child Left Behind reforms of the early 2000s um, and then the update to it, which was the Every Student Succeeds Act in 2015. Those two pieces of federal legislation are what really, you know, required and reaffirmed this testing schedule. And I think that, um, you know, there was an overhaul in curriculum that happened not accidentally around the same time. And and the curriculum is such that, at least in public schools, that by third grade is when there's an expectation that like some learning has happened and we are testing whether it has worked. So it's kind of tied to the curriculum. It's a little bit tied to kids' abilities to sit and take a test. Um, and it, it is that first departure point. And then you have something to kind of measure against as kids continue to grow. So, uh, you know, I think we, we have questions, you know, should we be doing so much testing? Should we be teaching to the test? I think there's a lot of really valid questions around that um, in education and, you know, more broadly. So, well, you mentioned No Child Left Behind. And I know as researchers, you, you don't, you keep your opinion out of things. You want your data to speak, but certainly the, the data informs public policy. And I, I was covering education when No Child Left Behind. And, and in the 20 years or so since then, I, you know, I argue that, you know, I think a lot of kids are being left behind, or certainly it has not improved education to the point where we think it is. But there's also, that was sort of where I look at as the sort of this testing culture, because standardized tests became this, you know, everyone was was reliant on this. And you're, you're kind of saying we're over-relying on it at this point with what we know. But we do need, and I understand that people want some sort of measure, that there are assessments because we want to know what kids know. But now that we're kind of looking, what you're finding is that the, the tests don't capture everything. There is this maybe misunderstanding or misuse. So how what what would you suggest parents and the public do with these scores? I mean, how should they be used? What what should we be doing with them? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I mean, I think they should be used as a piece of a larger 
puzzle. And just like in the healthcare system, when you go to your well child visit for your child, they put them on the scale. But if the child has lost a few pounds, they don't immediately, you know, put a, you know, feeding tube in, right? Uh, right. Losing a few pounds is considered in the context of so many other things. Well, have you changed your activity? And let's look, take a look at your, you know, blood metabolic panel and, and let's measure your breathing and make sure you're getting enough oxygen. And, you know, let's, let's ask, ask about your nutrition and habits. So it's part, it, it's an important data point. It's not unimportant, but it's one data point. And I think that's really where we have to go is, can we plug this puzzle piece in and surround it with lots of other data, um, you know, in a, in a similarly, you know, low cost and time efficient way that gives us just a more holistic picture of what kids no one can do what teachers are doing well and where teachers need support and where schools are doing well and where schools need support. I wanted to ask you about the term proficient because I know that you hear it a lot, you know, grade level, those kind of things. But, and I know in the state, they kind of, the State Department of Education changes what a proficient is, like yeah. the definition. Mm -hmm. But I wondered is, if that is a, an Oklahoma thing or do you see nationally what is considered proficient in California for a third grader is different than proficient in Oklahoma? I mean, is there any sort of agreement on what, where a, a, a child should be? Because I'm wondering, the more I get into testing, I'm seeing there are all these different standards that people hold. And I don't know if that's just our problem or a national problem. Well, I mean, I think, you know, education is, um, is you know, is the business of the states for sure. So there is a lot of state by state variation. Um, even though every state does administer standardized tests in the spring of third grade, um, the test itself is slightly different. So different publishers produce different tests. They change their names, they switch publishers. The content might change a tiny bit from year to year and from state to state. Um, you know, and and I think a state defines proficiency um, on its own. And, you know, state, state, state boards and they rely on different experts and different, you know, um, pieces of input and information to make those decisions. Um, I, 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 think, I, know, I wish it was more scientific. The, <laughs> well, I'm wondering if I'm speaking over you. I apologize. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Agreement in the, in the research world, like yeah. where a third grade kid should be in reading or math. I mean, or do, is, is that an evolution? Yeah, I mean, in the research world, we use what's called, you know, we use normed or age normed tests, okay. where you have a test um, that's given on a, a sample as the test developers develop the test. And then that sample has a distribution with a, you know, a mean and a standard deviation. And kids within one standard deviation of the mean are considered to be kind of like, you know, where they need to be. And kids who are more than one standard deviation above or below are considered maybe on the high end or in need of, of some additional supports on the lower end. And so we think about things as standard deviations or distance from the mean or the average on these norm tests that are age-based. So a nine-year-old is expected to be within one standard deviation of the nine-year-old average based on how the test was developed. And if they're more than a standard deviation below where most nine-year-olds are, or more than a standard deviation above, that's considered to be, um, you know, not proficient or maybe even exceptional on the high end. And so, you know, it's it's age-based. Um, so you're comparing a nine-year-old, which is, you know, the average age of a third grader, to other nine-year-olds okay. on the same test. And that, that would be one way to derive, like, where should we be? Okay. Is there, is there an argument to be had for people saying, well, what if they need it overall, they should be learning more. So the average nine-year-old, you know, we want to raise the expectations or does it just not work that way with, with, with in your world? No, I, I mean, I hear public policy people talking about that or lawmakers, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I think, you know, having high expectations is, is a great way to, to motivate and like grow. And, you know, that probably as a mom, right. You want to set the right. expectations high so people can have something to reach towards. Um, but, it, but it, but it, but you have to stay within the realm of like reality and what, you know, what kids can do um, and, and what, you know, developmentally um, kids can do and, and what kind of resources they've been given to get to that point. Right. So we know that, you know, kids from more disadvantaged communities you know, might have fewer of those extra supports, like, you know, extra tutoring or access to extra books and learning materials, even access to like devices to do kind of that, you know, app-based 
game learning in their free time. So, you know, there's going to be a little more catch up for some populations. Um, you know, it's hard to set a, a, a an absolute, you know, everyone needs to be here or we're not doing a good job. That is not uh, probably realistic. Okay. I like the idea that you're talking about reality and like laws because yeah. <laughs> in my reality and covering lawmakers that those yeah. don't go together. So yeah. that's, I know you're in your research world. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> but I did want to get back to, you mentioned in the op-ed um, kind of concerns about standardized tests being used to evaluate COVID effects mm -hmm. as there may be some problems with that. Can you, and you are, it, it's interesting that with your seed study, you're right in the thick of that, that COVID hit right in the middle of this research. Um, right what um what should we be doing in this post covid education world in trying to understand the effects and and maybe explain a little bit what do you see as the problematic use of using standardized tests and understanding covid effects yeah so this is another area where i think i'm i'm raising more questions than i'm answering but i think they're really right. important questions so one thing i i think we suspect um with our data is that uh the covid learning loss, which is really just like uh, muted growth from pre-COVID to post-COVID, might be a little bit more, uh, might be overstated when you look at these standardized tests than it would be when you look at something like one of our more research-based assessments. Um, so for example, you know, because in our seed study, we've been following kids every year since 2017, um, we have plenty of pre-COVID data on, on them. Um, and the third grade tests started when this particular group of kids that we've been following um, was, you know, one year after COVID. So we don't have pre-COVID third grade test score data on kids who only reached third grade after COVID, right? There's no, we can't compare them to themselves at an earlier time point. Comparing third graders before COVID to third graders after COVID are two entirely different populations, right? So that's a problem. And I do know that some states um, and some, you know, state education policy folks are doing that comparison. That's a problem. So third graders who were in third grade in 2019 did not experience a global pandemic for the two years beforehand. Third graders who were third graders in 2021 experienced a global pandemic for the two years beforehand. So to say that kids in third graders in 2021, you know, a, lar a smaller percentage of them were proficient on their third grade tests, having just come out of a global pandemic compared to 2019 or 2012 or 2008 or some earlier time point that never experienced a global pandemic that closed down their schools uh, is, is, not, is an apples to oranges comparison. So what we did in our data was we don't have third grade test scores on the same kids over time. What we do have is our test scores on the same kids over time. So we looked at kids right before COVID in first grade and right after COVID in third grade, same kids, right? So they missed their second grade year. They were still growing and developing. Second grade was the year that they had a lot of remote learning. We looked at their test scores pre-COVID and post-COVID um, on the things that did overlap with state test scores, like math word problems. And we looked at their scores from pre and post COVID on things that did not overlap with state test scores like this, you know, how quickly can you differentiate the number one from the number seven? Um, and what we found was that the growth slowed down more on the math word problems than it did on the how quickly can you tell the difference between two numbers math problems. So the kind of foundational math that we measure. Okay. So what we suspect is that the state standardized tests that look more like the math word problem test or more like a reading comprehension test for ELA might be telling a little bit of an overstated story of how much growth slowed down. Whereas on these other tests that we measured, like oral vocabulary and quick numeracy foundational math skills, the growth didn't slow down quite as much. Growth continued at a, at a, at a more uh, expected rate. And so I think the danger in using state test scores only to tell the story of pre to post growth COVID learning loss is, is a problem, not just because we're comparing kids who never experienced a pandemic to kids who did, but also because we're using a test that looks like it shows slowed down growth, even within the same kids. Um, and so like I think that goes that, back, it goes back to the op-ed showing that yeah. he's maybe doing great with, with doing math calculations, but it's just not showing up because of this the right. score. 
And I've oh, and you're right on on that comparison from year to year because I find, and it's a, almost like a school issue, that punitive issue of well, school A, their you know their test scores went down mm-hmm. from year to year, but they're totally different groups of kids. Yeah. And I don't and I don't know why the public doesn't make that connection that there are some years where you may have a class of kids struggling, and you might have a year where you have half your class are gifted and talented kids where. Mm-hmm. It, it it never made sense to me in that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so here's the bigger question yeah. that, uh, and this kind of gives you a chance to talk about some of the, the Georgetown research from that was released last year, because um, you're looking at third grade mm-hmm. and in the in what it takes for long term. How do you we get kids to adulthood? What what is the the best predictor of later success among third grade students? So what are you finding? to be the best investment, you know, in those early years for good outcomes by the time they are graduating and entering adulthood, so. Yeah, so in in our research, our kids are now only in fifth grade, right? Our kids are the ones who right, were right, COVID seats, and yeah. came out in third grade. Um, so we're seeing, you know, really positive impacts of pre-K participation in 2017, even though COVID happened in the middle, we're seeing kids who attended pre-K come out of COVID with stronger, Um, reading comprehension skills and uh, stronger foundational math skills and better self-regulation, which is that working memory, the ability to keep those instructions in your mind. It's key for solving problems. Um, It's really important for life. Um, And uh, and we think that although our kids are still, you know, only in the end of elementary school, we think that we have maybe discovered what explains why in the earlier research of the kids who are now in college, why pre-K seems to promote better high school and college outcomes. We think it might be because it promotes better middle and early childhood academic and self-regulation outcomes. And so and so that sometimes those are hard to measure. I mean it's yeah. it's hard to how do you measure self-regulation? And I and that's not a bad word for people out there who wonder yeah. about that. But um but it is interesting how that idea of fade out ended up being for what, like I say, it was the the question mark. For whatever reason, by the time they reached college or high school and college, they were higher performing again. Mm-hmm. And I, of course, I always argued that maybe we just don't know what to do with middle school kids. Like yeah. those preteen kids, I'm sorry, that's well, mom. I mean, rough. <laughs> I, I, I hate to say it, but the fade out stories were mostly told with standardized tests. Right. Well, you're true. Which makes me, and let's say, the more I get into the understanding about how tests work, the more I'm thinking this is not the right test. Start over. <laughs> yeah. Well and, they, they, well, and I know in Tulsa they do, a, you know, internally they they do map testing where they're yeah. testing, you know, something like two to four times a year, and it really does show more, more. It, it's more in, informative for me as a parent when I mm-hmm. see where my children are at the beginning of the year to the end of the year, rather yeah. than just one year that honestly I had a teenage son that he just blew off a standardized test one year he was in middle school mm-hmm. you would have thought he had no education that mm-hmm. one year oh yeah yeah next year yeah. he was highly proficient I mean yeah. it just yeah. didn't make sense yeah. to me so yeah I appreciate your time I think this is such an important op-ed in really understanding how we should view these score these tests and how we need to make them better maybe build upon them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. serious every lawmaker needs to read this and listen to you Absolutely. So. I, I am I am thrilled to, to that you picked up on it. And, and I think it's the beginning of a bigger conversation. Well, I always give the guests the last word to kind of wrap up. So what are some thoughts you want to leave people with about oh, this? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I what is this? What is we haven't covered. Big question. I mean, I think uh, I think we have a lot of exciting evidence that um, that pre-K done in a, in a place that has supported pre-K universally for a long time uh, has figured out how to get it right, despite lots of other challenges. Um, Tulsa and the Tulsa Public Schools have done a terrific job supporting kids' early education. That's why the kids who attend pre-K, at least in our data, seem to be outperforming kids who didn't. Um, and, uh, and I think the things on which they outperform them are things that state tests and other standardized tests maybe don't capture. So I look forward to, you know, the next couple years continuing to to sing the praises of, of what's going well in early education and how that carries kids on trajectories of success, you know, pandemics aside. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm so glad you're you're doing a second generation of, of research. And just to, to, to let some of the readers know, 
among that first generation, some of the more interesting things they found among the 20 year olds, or, you know, after, after, after 20 years was things like kids that went through pre-K, they vote more often. Yep. They have the more uh, college going rates or certification, workforce certifications. And so this research is so important in understanding where we need to place our, our public investment. So, so thank you. And I look forward to, to the research as it, as you make more findings. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me.